Some of you may remember that the book of Revelation can be summarized in four words. Pastor Wilson talked about that last night. Jesus wins and Satan loses. Revelation's final events need not frighten us. They need not scare us. They can encourage us with the sense that we're living on the knife edge of eternity. As you think back, you may remember the flight of the Columbia Space Shuttle. There's something about space that fascinates us, something about space that intrigues us, something about space that ministers or speaks to our curiosity. The, on January 16, 2003, the Columbia blasted off. It had seven astronauts aboard. There were five men, two women, and for the first time an Israeli astronaut was going to be going into space. At that blast off, at the lift off, the propulsion was so great that it ripped a piece of foam off the Challenger. That piece of foam hit some tiles, but unbeknownst to mission control, those one of the tiles or two or three were broken, and the wires began to heat. They heated up above normal. Nothing happened initially until on February 1, 2003, the Columbia was going to enter our atmosphere again. And as it did, that spaceship exploded. All seven were killed. All of us one day are going to go on a space journey. But here's the incredible good news. This journey will not only begin well, but it's going to end well. When Jesus comes in ret to return, the journey that we are going to go on, this journey through space, we have a commander that is committed to take us home. Our commander is not going to abort the mission. The final mission is not going to explode some way so that uh, men and women on that mission experience fatalities. We are going to travel beyond the moon 240,000 miles away, travel beyond the planets, travel beyond the sun 93 million miles away. Think of what it's going to be like traveling through space, speeding through the air, traveling up through Orion, that great chasm in space that even scientists now wonder about what's at the end of that. Traveling to the throne of God, seeing the golden gleaming gates of the city of God open, and hearing the angels sing, welcome home, earth beings. We've ascended from earth. We've traveled through space. We have the warm welcome of the angels and the warm embrace of heavenly beings. The entire theme of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the central theme of the book of Revelation. Now when you look at Revelation, there are two aspects of it, two what I would call foci of Revelation. We have Jesus the Lamb of God and we have Jesus the coming King. 28 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is mentioned at the, as the Lamb of God. That's four times seven. Seven in the book of Revelation is a symbol of perfection. You've got seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven branch candlestick. That's a symbol of perfection. Four in the book of Revelation is a symbol of universality. So when you have four times seven, 28 times the Lamb of God is mentioned. Christ, the perfect universal Savior for all mankind. So Jesus is mentioned as the Lamb in the book of Revelation, but he's also mentioned in the book of Revelation as the coming King. And the theme of the book of Revelation is the Christ that came once to provide our salvation is coming again to take us home. When Jesus came the first time, he was born as a babe in Bethlehem's manger. And very, very few people recognized his first coming. In a sense, we might say it was a silent coming. There were a few shepherds there. Later, the wise men came. But most people had no idea about the coming of Christ the first time. They didn't sense that he was the Messiah. When he comes the second time, that's going to be dramatically different. Nobody is going to miss it. God's end time plan of just how Jesus is going to come is revealed throughout the book of Revelation and in his word. 
Let's look at some of the passages in Revelation that talk about the return of Jesus and this coming king. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we read, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Throughout Scripture, kingdoms rise and fall. Babylon rises and falls. Medo-Persia rises and falls. Greece rises and falls. Rome rises and falls. Throughout history, nations rise and nations fall. But the kingdom of Christ will last forever and ever and ever and ever. Revelation 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Here's another prophecy in Revelation, Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man. And the scripture says that um, this Christ that came, that sat like the Son of Man, on his head was a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, now in the Bible, for example, a, a sharp sickle in Scripture represents reaping. A trumpet represents victory. So when you think of Christ coming with this sharp sickle, that represents judgment. It represents harvest. When you, he comes with the trumpet, that represents the glory of victory. So when Jesus comes again, it's judgment for all humanity, that final judgment when the righteous are caught up to meet him in the sky, the wicked living are destroyed with the brightness of his coming, and the trumpet blast of victory. Jesus wins, Satan loses. We find that in Revelation 14, the harvest idea. We then go to Revelation chapter 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And upon that white horse, horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. The scripture goes on to put it this way, and the armies in heaven clothed with white linen, fine linen, white and clean, followed him on their white horses. Now in scripture, a white horse is a symbol of purity, victory, and triumph. When the Roman, Romans attacked and overthrew a particular country, they would leave and return the general would on a white horse leading the captives. So look at the symbols we've studied so far in Revelation. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the one that died for us, the perfect Savior. 28 times in the book of Revelation he's mentioned. Jesus is the coming King. Every prophecy in Revelation, every sequence in Revelation, ends with victory for Christ. Not one of those sequences ends with a defeat for Jesus. If you look at the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, every prophecy points to one place. Every prophecy comes to a glorious climax. Every prophecy finds its focal point in Jesus Christ, who comes as King of Kings. Jesus, who comes as Lord of Lords. Jesus, who comes to defeat wickedness. Jesus, who comes to destroy evil. Jesus, who comes to vanquish the powers of hell. The Christ, who triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell, will indeed come again, streaming down the corner of the sky. But the question says, there are so many different ideas about how Jesus will come back the second time. And how can I know that I'll be ready when he comes? In the scripture, the Bible leaves no question about the return of Christ. Now, there will be a great deal of deception before Jesus comes. Jesus warns us of that. Luke, the 17th chapter, the 23rd verse. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. The scripture continues, Matthew 24, 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. So there will be deceptions. There will be those that say, Christ has appeared. He's there in New York City, and he's healing the sick in the masses. He's there in Tokyo. He's there in Paris. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, the devil will come down upon you knowing he has a short time. 
wouldn't it be just like the devil and his evil angels to masquerade as a being of dazzling brightness to deceive the multitudes just before the true coming of Christ? Wouldn't it be just like the devil to try to pull off a counterfeit second coming, to deceive thousands of people? What if there were stadiums that were packed? What if the devil put his spell upon people and made them sick and then took that off and they were apparently healed? But the Bible tells us not to be deceived because we know that when Jesus comes, he's not going to come down walking upon this earth. He's not going to come down and appear in this place or in that place. The Bible tells us just how Jesus is going to come. Luke 17, verse 24. Let's read it together from the screen. You ready to read? Luke 17, verse 24. Reading together. For as lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in this day. So when Jesus comes, it's like lightning flashes from one end of heaven to the other. It is not some secret event. It is not some silent event. Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up from below. He's not coming to walk among human beings as a great healer or miracle worker. Christ's coming also is not some kind of spiritual, mystical event in which Jesus comes into the hearts of human beings and there is kind of an age of Aquarius or peace on earth. There are some who teach that Christ is going to come secretly in some kind of a rapture. We're going to talk about that a little later in the lecture and look at those passages. There's others who have the idea that when Christ comes he's going to usher in a new millennium and that the second coming of Christ in the Bible is really the coming of Christ to the hearts of people and Jesus is going to bring peace on earth. Now don't misunderstand me. Christ wants to come into our hearts, change our lives from within. But the only time there'll be permanent peace on earth is when the Prince of Peace descends from the sky. The only time there'll be peace on earth permanently is when Jesus comes down from the sky and we're caught up to meet him in the air and ultimately his holy city descends. The coming of Christ is not some nirvana event, but the coming of Christ is a very real a very literal event. Let's look at it in Scripture. You remember Jesus stood on the mountain there, about ready to ascend to heaven. Man steps off a mountain and goes down. God steps off a mountain and goes up because the laws of gravity cannot keep the creator of gravity down. And the Bible says the angels there are, are there beside the disciples. Now, I can just imagine that scene in my mind. Christ is about ready to come to heaven. And the angels look at the Father, and they say, Father, the disciples are going to go through some very traumatic times. Father, the disciples, are, many of them will be persecuted. All of them except one may suffer, will suffer a martyr's death. They say to God, God, can we go and encourage their hearts? So angels descend from the realms of glory, and they come down. And the disciples are standing there, gazing up into heaven. They're straining their necks to see the last lingering vision of the Christ that's walked with them and talked with them and been with them for these last three and a half years. And the angel says, this same Jesus, the same Jesus that walked the dusty streets of Galilee, the same Jesus that walked the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, the same Jesus that touched the eyes of the blind, they were open, the same Jesus that touched the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped, the same Jesus that touched the withered man's legs and it was healed, this same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven, so shall come again as in like manner as you've seen him go up into heaven. When the angels say Jesus is coming again, I believe it. What about you, friends? The Bible says that Christ is going to come in like manner. He ascended in the clouds, and he will descend in the clouds. A very real Christ ascended, and a very real Christ will descend. So Christ's coming is literal. Christ's coming is also a visible event. It's not simply an event that takes place that we perceive in our hearts. It's a very real, literal event, and it's a visible event. 
The Bible says, Revelation 1, 7, behold, let's read it. Behold, he's coming with clouds. He, he, he might come, right? Maybe he'll come, right? It's likely he'll come, right? What, what's what scripture say? He is coming with what? Clouds. And a few people are going to see him. Every eye is going to see him. The eyes of the young and the eyes of the old. The eyes of the rich and the eyes of the poor. African eyes will see him come. Asian eyes will see him come. South American eyes will see him come. And we will see him come. Every eye will see him come. Now somebody said, Pastor Mark, we live in a round world. How can every eye see him come? The Bible says he's going to come as lightning, right? What is the speed of light? The speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. That means in far less than a second, Jesus could circle the earth. And your eyes cannot discern a fraction of a second. So if Jesus is coming with the speed of light, and the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, he can circle the earth so quickly that every eye could see him and discernibly it would be at the same time. So the Bible says he's coming and every eye is going to see him. It doesn't say he's coming some kind of secretly, does it? Christ's coming also, the Bible says, is going to be an audible event. So it's a, it's a literal event, it's a visible event, and it's also an audible event. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. With a what? Boy, that was a great shout. With a what? Shout. With a shout, yeah. Why do you shout a shout? Why do you shout a shout? You shout a shout because you want to get attention, right? So this doesn't seem very silent, does it? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. That's a trumpet of glory, the trumpet of victory. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Incidentally, it's a little strange to think, if the dead already went to heaven, well, why are they going to rise? You see, that's what the Bible teaches 53 times. It teaches death is but asleep. So when you die, you rest. There's no consciousness. Christ comes and he raises the dead. And then the Bible says that as the dead in Christ rise, it tells us that we together with them are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I remember one night I was speaking about the second coming of Christ and the glorious day that when Jesus Christ would come again, and uh, when the graves would open and Jesus would return. And as I was speaking, I said, how can I ever make this real to an audience? And I thought, what if, what if I just describe an imaginary scene? And I said, let's suppose you had a little baby, six months old, and the baby had a terrible crib death. It pulled the blanket over its head and the baby died. And you would go to that grave and you would just weep over that grave. But one day, Lightning shines from the east to the west. One day, the earth trembles. One day, Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, and that baby is resurrected and put in your arms. And I kept thinking, how can I ever make this real to my audience? And I said, what if that little baby's name was Amanda? I had never used that name in a lecture before. And what if little Amanda was raised from the dead, Mama? And what if she was put in your arms and together you felt those little hands on your cheeks again. You, you looked into that little baby's eyes again and you saw her smile again. And together with the angels you ascend to heaven where there's no sickness, suffering, and death. At the end of the meeting, a lady came up to me and said, Pastor, we got to talk. I said, what do you mean? She said, how, do you know? how did you know? I said, how did I know what? How did you know that I had a little baby by the name of Amanda? And the baby died at six months. And I came to your meeting tonight so depressed. I had gone to the psychologist, and the psychologist said, the only way you can be free from this terrible memory is to buy a doll, name it Amanda, and then go have another burial for that doll and, and say goodbye to the doll. She said, Pastor, I didn't know what to do. I was so discouraged because of the death of my baby, but I came to your meeting tonight. And I saw that death is not the end. I saw there was going to be a glorious resurrection. And when you read that passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. What are the next two words, everybody? Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, Lord in the air. Someday you can see that father that died. Someday you can see that mother that died. Someday that child 
that is so sick that you put in that grave is going to rise up again and we're going to travel through the clouds together. No more separation, no more heartache, no more sorrow, no more death, no more longing for that warm embrace that you cannot feel any longer. Jesus is coming. Every eye will see him. Every ear will hear him. And the Bible says, so we shall ever be with the Lord. Christ's coming is also a glorious event. We read about it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. A real Christ is coming in the sky. A real Christ is coming to resurrect the dead. A real Christ is coming to take us home. The journey on earth may be long. The road on earth may be rough. Sickness, suffering, death, accidents. But yet, the Son of Man is going to appear in the heavens. Now, Jesus' coming is not going to be a, is not going to be a joyous event for everybody. Because the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 30, the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, notice when Jesus comes, it's not that he comes to rapture the righteous and the... Uh, living wicked, the living unsaved, don't know what happened. It's not that at all. The Son of Man is going to appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. Who are the tribes of the earth? The unsaved. And then the Bible says, every eye is going to see him. That's the eyes of the wicked and the eyes of the righteous. That's the eyes of the saved and that's the eyes of the unsaved. And it says, they will see. That's the unrighteous. That's the wicked. So it's not just that the righteous see him coming and they're raptured off. Not at all. It says they'll see the Son of Man coming with clouds, with power and great glory. Jesus came as a babe in Bethlehem's manger once. He came and very few people knew he had come. But the second time, when this whole controversy between good and evil ends, when this whole crisis between good and evil ends, Christ is not going to come secretly. The whole universe is going to know it. It's glorious. Every eye sees it. Every ear hears it. It is a climactic event as well. This event settles the human destiny of all humanity. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 15, verse 51 to 53, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, what everybody? Sleep. So death is like a sleep until the coming of Jesus. We shall not all sleep. But what does it say? We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So when we go to sleep in death, it's like the next thing we know, we wake up. Like, you know, when our children were young, we used to bring them to meetings. And so sometimes when my little boy, Mark Jr., was young, he is in dermatology now and sees about 40, 50 patients a day at times. But when he was a little boy, I'd be preaching in these stadiums and auditoriums like this. My wife would bring him and we'd have a little, little uh, blanket and we'd put him over here in the little blanket. He'd sleep. Now, he would go to sleep during my preaching. It's all right if he goes to sleep, but you better not. Uh, but so he'd sleep. And at the end of the meeting, I'd carry him. You know, we were in New England at the time and up in Connecticut, you know, it's snow. And uh, we'd be taking him home. And sometimes the roads would be icy and I'd kind of drive and skid, go past a truck, you know, and so forth and so on. You'd, you'd almost go in a ditch and I'd get him home. He'd still be sleeping, put him in the little crib. And uh, next morning, this little boy would wake up. He'd say, Daddy, are we still at the meeting? You still preaching? I said, son, I preach long, but I don't preach that long, you know. And so, you see, he had no consciousness of time, did he? He fell asleep. And so the next thing we know, that father that mother, that sister, that brother that is resting in, in Jesus right now in that grave, the next thing they know is Jesus calling their name. John, come forth. Mary, come forth. Alice, come forth. Joseph, come forth. And those graves open. And their bodies are changed immediately, as the Bible says. And they receive glorious immortal bodies. And as they do that, we too who are living receive those glorious immortal bodies. The Bible says, the trumpet shall sound a victory. The dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. Traveling through the illimitable realms of space, this corruptible must put on incorruption. 
this mortal. What does mortal mean? Subject to death. What does mortal mean? It means subject to disease, heartache, sorrow. We must put on immortality. No sickness, no suffering, no death, no heartache. Christ comes, the graves are open, the living righteous and the righteous dead are caught up to meet Christ in the sky. Can you imagine what that's going to be? The most spectacular event in the history of the universe. You do not want to miss it. Is anything worth clinging to to miss the event of the second coming of Christ? Are any of the trinkets and cheap pleasures of the world or the habits worth holding on to to miss that day when Jesus Christ returns again? Revelation 15.3 says that great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. Jesus wants to bring everybody to heaven. But if Jesus brought everybody to heaven, it wouldn't be heaven. It would be Indianapolis, right? What do you think, right? So Jesus wants to bring everybody to heaven. But he's, he can't do that because if he did, somebody would be robbing the streets of gold. Somebody would be climbing over the walls and trying to rob something else. So, so Jesus wants now to come into your heart and mine. To so fundamentally change us from within that we experience the presence of God here. And that we are so in tune with God and his presence so fills our lives that we no longer have a taste for earth in our mouth. We long for the streets of eternity. We long for fellowship with Christ. We have such fellowship with him here that we long for that permanent fellowship in heaven. And we long for that day when the sad saga of death will be over. And we long for that day when he will come. We long for that day, as it says in Isaiah 25, verse 9, Behold, this is our God. We have done what? What have we done? We've waited for it. We haven't given up in trial. We haven't given up in difficulty. We haven't given up in sorrow. We haven't given up in disease. We haven't even accepted the false Christ who has come. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We'll be glad and rejoice in his salvation. It will be worth waiting. Whatever trial you go through. Whatever difficulty you go through. It's going to be worth it when Jesus Christ comes again. That's why the Bible says to us, Behold, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. People come to meetings like this all the time. And they say to me, Pastor Mark, um, I know I should make a decision for Christ, but, but, but. Don't worry about your buts, just make the decision. See, somebody says, but, 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 but don't, I told you, don't worry about those buts, just make your decision for Christ. Here's the point. Did the Red Sea open before Moses stepped in or after Moses stepped in? He had to put his feet in the water, right? So the problems that you are facing that hold you back from walking through this baptismal pool and totally giving your life to Christ, those problems are not going to be solved unless you step out. Unless you say, Lord, I am trusting you. Lord, I'm making a decision for you. Lord, I'm committing my life to you. Our eternal destiny is being settled by the choices we make every single day. Now, let's summarize what happens when Jesus comes. First, the Bible says there'll be a great earthquake, so there'll be seismic upheavals, lightning flashes from the east to the west. The righteous dead will be resurrected. The righteous living will be changed. Immortality will be bestowed on both the dead and the living. The wicked living will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The righteous will welcome Christ, uh, and the righteous together will ascend to heaven. Now, Somebody says, but Mark, there's a text in the Bible that says that uh, Jesus is going to come as a thief. There's a text in the Bible like that. I, I, and, I, and isn't there a text in the Bible that says something about two in the field, one taken, one left? 1,500 times in the Bible, the Bible mentions the second coming of Christ. Once in every eight verses in the, for every eight verses in the Old Testament, that for every one verse in the Old Testament that speaks about the 
first coming of Christ, there are eight verses that speak about the second coming of Christ. Once in every 25 verses in the New Testament, it speaks about the coming of Christ. Those verses all speak about Jesus coming. Every eye is going to see him. Every ear is going to hear him. It's like lightning flashes from the east unto the west. So if you have a few texts, you don't throw out 1,500 texts to try to harmonize them with a few. You look at the context of those few texts. So let's, let's just look at them. Does the Bible say Jesus is coming as a thief? It does. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that hour, now notice the key word here is that day or hour. No one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But know this. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, the scripture says, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken up. Now notice what this text is emphasizing. It is not emphasizing how Christ comes, but the time is coming. It says, if we would have known the hour, the time of his coming, that he's coming as a thief. So in other words, when the Bible uses the term thief, it is indicating that Jesus would come at a time, at an hour, we don't expect it. So let me ask you about Indianapolis thieves. Anybody here know anything about Indianapolis thieves? Do they come like this? Don't leave your house tonight because I'm going to crawl in your back window and rob you. Do Indianapolis thieves announce their coming? Do they do that? You say, Pastor Mark, they certainly don't do that. So they come swiftly, quickly, unexpectedly, right? So when Jesus comes, it's a literal coming. Every eye sees it. Every ear hears it. He comes with lightning. He comes with 10,000 times 10,000 angels gloriously. But he comes quickly and unexpectedly as a thief. That's what the Bible says. Look, Matthew 24, 44, therefore you also be ready. Why we ought to be ready? For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect it. So the thief references have nothing to do with the manner of his coming, everything to do with his, the time of his coming. Now, to show you that in another text, that this is not speaking about the manner of Christ's coming, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. So this is not some rapture where Jesus sneaks back as a thief and raptures a few people. When he comes as a thief, he comes with what kind of noise, everybody? What kind of noise? Great noise. And then the Bible says, what else happens when he comes as a thief? The elements will melt with fervent heat. So when he comes as a thief, it's not that he raptures a few, but he comes with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it are going to be what? Burned up. So when Jesus comes, there's no second chance. When Christ comes, men and women are, are, are saved or lost. The second coming of Christ is a surprise to the unprepared. But somebody says, but Pastor Mark... There's some passage in the Bible someplace about one taken and the other left. This is one of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted texts of all the Bible. Look what it says. Luke 17, verse 36. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Does it say that the person who's left is left alive? Is that what it says? No, it just says he's left. Okay. Then Jesus explains that passage. He says, as it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, how many classes were there? Two. One class went into the ark, one class did not go into the ark. So you only have two classes in the days of Noah. Was anybody left alive on earth in the days of Noah? No. So one taken, one left in the days of Noah. One saved, one lost. One alive, one dead. Then he goes on. Likewise, it'll be in the days of what? Lot. What was it like in the days of Lot? Did some come out of the city? Yes. Lot and his family. They were saved. Were some left in the city? Yes. Were they left alive? No. They were destroyed. So then Luke 17 says, it's like that when the Son of Man comes. And the question is asked, when the Son of Man comes, where, Lord? In other words, what happened to these people who were not saved? And the Bible says, where the body is gathered, they will be gathered. So they're destroyed with the brightness of Christ's coming. The point of this parable, one taken and one left, is that there only be two classes. In other words, our salvation is not something to trifle with. Our salvation is not something to play with. 
that God is speaking to our hearts. Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man. The Bible says, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. When Jesus comes, he comes to save all humanity. But those that have rejected his love, those that have turned their backs on his claims, those who will not accept the gracious invitation that he gives them, and who have idols in their heart and refuse to walk all the way in his truth, he couldn't possibly bring them into heaven because they're not safe to save. And they would start this rebellion all over again. And so the scripture says, the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? In other words, what scripture is saying is there's no second opportunity. There is the time to get serious about your salvation is now. And if you've been hesitating about any decision for Christ, this is the hour to make that decision. God did not bring you to these meetings simply to learn further information. You may be a church member, you may be a not a church member. Whoever you are today, God has brought you here for a purpose. In his divine drama of destiny, in the interweaving of the providences of God, God has brought you here for a purpose. He's brought you here to make eternal decisions, to take another step in your Christian life. Because when Christ comes again, it'll be a literal coming. It'll be a visible coming. It'll be an audible coming. It'll be a glorious coming. It'll be a climactic coming. And it will be an incredible, joyous event. Jesus said, read it with me please from the screen, John 14, verse 2 and 3. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus says, good news. Jesus says, let your hearts be filled with joy. Jesus says, when tears flow from your eyes and you have lost a loved one. Jesus says, have that assurance. I will come again. Some time ago, my mother developed cancer. Her mother had been a two-pack-a-day smoker, and mom took up the problem of smoking and smoked a pack and a half, and then finally quit, committed her life fully to Christ, but the damage done from smoking was there. Mom developed lung cancer, and we shared with her, kept sharing with her the promises of Christ's coming, that Jesus would come, and his lightning shines from the east even unto the west. We knew she didn't have much time left. And I kept asking my sisters, because I was traveling and preaching tours and had seen my mother before I went on the tours. And I said to my sisters, now look, I've got to go preaching again. She may survive another month. It may be three months. It may be six months. We just don't know. So I'll call in every day, and um, you let me know how she's doing. So we were traveling in the Caribbean, and I called my sisters, and they said, Mark, she took a turn for the worst. It looks like within a few days she's going to die. You need to come home. So we left our preaching tour, and I got a ticket, Tini and I, my wife and I, and we, we flew home. My mother was living in Deltona, Florida at that time, and uh, I flew into Orlando. Didn't get there till about 12, 12.30 at night, and we didn't want my mother to die in the hospital. So we, brought her, we had brought her home before that, and we put her in a hospital bed in the living room. I tried to be quiet. Tini and I opened the door, coming into the house. And she's lying on this bed in the living room. And you know, there are some experiences you have in life that they're deeply etched in your brain. You never forget them. And I walked into that room that night, and I was just coming through the door, and I heard my mother's voice, and this is what she said. Son, I knew you would come. Son, I knew you would come. She knew that I would not let her die alone. She knew that I would be there holding her hand and rubbing our fingers through her hair. Son, I knew you would come. 
And Jesus says to you and to me today, my child, whatever tears flow from your eyes, whatever heartache breaks your heart, whatever loved ones you have lost, I'm going to come. I am going to come. And I want you to be ready for my coming. I want you to put priorities on the thing that really counts. And there's only one thing that can satisfy us today and forever. And that's an eternal decision for Christ. That's an eternal decision for the King of kings and Lord of lords. My dear friend, Pastor Kevin, is going to enter the baptismal pool just now. Here are two that have made that eternal decision for Christ. Praise God, Pastor Kevin. Pastor of the Capitol Memorial Church. And he has two that are walking in the water. They want to be ready for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They want to be ready when Jesus descends down the corridors of the sky. Emily is walking in the water. Raise your hand, Emily, so I can see you, okay? There she is. Can you greet her? Raise your hand. Say, praise God for Emily. And Sandra is walking in the water as well. Praise God for these two ladies who've made their decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We raise our hand now, Miss Emily. We thank God for your decision to follow Jesus. We thank God that he's touched your life and that you want to follow him now and forever. So we lift our hands to heaven and we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 My dear sister, you are clean. Pastor will pray for you. And Sandra, Emily's granddaughter has come. And she has come to commit her life anew to Christ. She has come to be cleansed by the grace of Christ. She has come to follow Jesus and keep his commandments and walk in the way of Christ. So my dear sister, because you want to follow Jesus, you want nothing between your soul and Jesus. You want to walk in his way, be part of his last day people that around the world today, over 3,000 will be baptized into the Adventist church and family. And so we lift our hands to heaven and baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Charles, sing I've Decided. One verse. Let's get him singing it together. I, I have decided sing together. to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No, no turning, turning back. back. The world behind me. The, the world, world behind me. me. The cross. The, the cross, cross before me. The world. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. No, no turning, turning back. Many of you last evening filled out a response card that you want to look forward to baptism. We have another response card today. Ushers, can you pass that out just now, please? I want to be sure that our message was clear to you today. 
by filling out the response card, and I hope every single one of you will fill this out, because it really, it does two things. One, it helps us to understand that the messages we have are clear. But second, the response card helps you in your walk with Christ. The first line on this card says, I believe Jesus will come literally, personally, visibly, and audibly. How many of you, that's clear to you today, that when Christ comes, just say amen, he's going to come literally, personally, visibly, and audibly. Is that clear to you today? Was it clear from the lecture? Okay, check that box. Just put a box there. If you need a pen or a pencil, just raise your hand, please, okay? Because I want to be sure that every person fills out this card. You may be a church member, you may not be, but that's okay. Just fill out the card. Secondly, it says, I desire to be ready for Jesus' return. If that is your commitment today, that you say, look, there may be some things in my life that are not in harmony with God's will, but I want to be ready for the return of Christ. You can check that second box, okay? Third box, I'd like to be baptized soon. If you have not yet walked through the water of baptism, when you walk through that water, it's a symbol that your sins are cleansed, so you have new life in Christ. The peace of God will flow into your life and Jesus promises the Holy Spirit at baptism and as we open our hearts, he grants us the power, he grants us the strength of his Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. One of the reasons many people keep stumbling and falling is they've never made that commitment to Christ. And as the result of that, they stumble, they fall all the time. But if we make that commitment, we make the commitment, Christ supplies the power. So check that box, I'd like to be baptized soon. Now let me talk to, to you about some people who have already been baptized. There may be people, there are two reasons for rebaptism. Number one, you may have been baptized and you drifted away. You've, you, you broke the commandments of God and you, you, you lived a life that was not in harmony with God's will and you still feel uncomfortable about that. When you go into the water to be rebaptized, you are recommitting. We don't get rebaptized every time we sin. But if you have been separated from Christ, he is appealing to you today to make that decision for rebaptism. The second reason we're rebaptized is this. There are many Baptist Christians, many Pentecostal Christians. They've been baptized by immersion. But they come to meetings like this and they hear Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, where Jesus says, go therefore uh, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatever I've commanded you. They never learned what Christ commanded, knew very little about the Bible's Sabbath. And they desire to walk into the water again, to cleanse from the errors of the past. That may be your choice. If you choose, you can be part of the family of God by profession of your faith if you've already been baptized. But check that third box and we'll counsel you. If you need more reading material on Jesus coming, simply fill out that box. Take time to meditate upon your decision right now. If you need a prayer request, write it on the back. Our prayer team will fill that out. And Charles, Lord, I'm coming home. Lord, I'm coming home. Just take a moment to hold your card in your hand. Pray over your card. Make this a very sacred moment of trust for you. We're going to pray together. Oh, my Father, our hearts are full. We think of the second coming of Christ. And it's the most glorious event in history. And Lord, we don't want one person to miss that. So my dear Father, move among us. Thank you for these eternal decisions made on these cards. And we look forward to that day when Jesus will return. And every one of us, not missing one, will be in heaven with you together. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated.